All right, great. Let's get started. Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Andy Arnold, CEO and Senior Wealth Advisor here at Centerline Wealth Advisors. Today's session is on new student loan repayment options. And our very own CFP, Tom Teal, is here to dive into the complex world of higher education funding. He has some special expertise in this area and as a father of two college students is very well versed in the subject. Along the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat section below. Tom, let's dive into this topic. I, I keep reading about changes to the program, about the size of the issue. I think it's close to $2 trillion. It's a giant problem. How are students, families, and graduates supposed to navigate all of this? I'm, I'm sure you're going to tell us with this uh, great presentation you put together here today. Yeah, let's uh, get ready to jump into it. In terms of uh, fun presentations, this probably comes right behind talking about estate planning. It's definitely <laughs> not, not a topic people enjoy. And in terms of being able to empathize, uh, yeah, Andy mentioned, I've got kids that are generating student loans. Uh, ben and Lauren in our office are both paying back student loans. Most likely, uh, if you're on this webinar, student loans have impacted you either directly or someone in your family, somebody you know, we, we're, we've all had experience. And unfortunately, like I said, it's not the most fun topic. But uh, with that said, let's kind of jump in here. And can everybody see that okay? Maybe right. you try again. Let's see. Are we set to, yeah, we're set, set to share. Uh, oh, hold on one second. There it goes. All right. How about that? Perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, today <clears throat> uh, we're going to briefly go through student loan repayment, a um, couple of the different income-driven repayment plans, a couple of changes since uh, COVID, which feels like uh, it was 15 years ago. Uh, for some of us, it's still going on, but um, we'll talk through that. One kind of a bit of a disclaimer before we get started is because everybody's loan situation is so different in terms of how much debt you have, what your income is, what your personal situation is, it's very hard to get into details on all these different plans uh, and try to talk about what the best fit is because it is completely individualized. Unfortunately, it's it's the government, so it's very complex. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into figuring out what your payment is going to be or what the what the best option is. So again, this is a pretty high level. Uh, discussion. If you do have specific questions, definitely reach out to us. I'm sure if you have student loans, you're familiar with studentaid.gov. Most of your interactions with your student loans are going to happen through there, but they do have some, some good tools on there too. Um, again, just kind of a recap of what we want to cover today. So we'll talk about some of the impacts of COVID and what that had on your student loans. Uh, we'll talk about some of the expanded forgiveness. I'm sure you've seen in the news <clears throat> uh, some new stories about $9 billion being forgiven. I think that was the latest one. There's been uh, a couple different ones. We'll talk about that briefly, and then we'll talk about the different repayment programs. And then lastly, just um, an additional student loan borrower protection that got put in place recently. So repayment restart. If you have student loans, I'm sure you're unfortunately well aware by now payments have restarted. So as of October Everybody's catching up on making their payments to student loans. Um, the good thing is during COVID is all student loans were basically frozen. Uh, no interest accrued, no payments were due. <clears throat> so that was helpful for a lot of people. But of course, the government eventually wants to get their money back. So uh, payments have restarted. Um, they're due in October, as we said. Um, there is an on-ramp period. So we're not advocating that you don't make your student loan payments. Certainly make your student loan payments if you're able to. But if there's some administrative issue with your payment account, uh, some kind of open questions, maybe you tried to change payment plans. Again, if there's some issue, there is an on-ramp period until September of next year. So September 30th of 2024. This on-ramp period basically prevents any servicers from um, putting you into default. So if you miss a payment, the payment obviously 
doesn't count against your student loans and interest is still going to accrue, uh, but servicers can't, can't put you into default. So certainly work through any issues you have as soon as possible, but you do have a bit of a, a grace period. A couple other tips as, as loan payments get started here. Number one, uh, log in and verify your servicer. There's been some servicers since the beginning of COVID that are no longer servicing loans and they've been transferred over. It shouldn't dramatically impact you or your payback, um, but definitely make sure your payments should not have changed. Unless you consolidated or made some change during COVID, you should be picking up right where you left off from a payment standpoint. Uh, one other quick tip is auto pay. If you are set for auto pay, make sure you go in and verify that it's still set up and working. Actually, um, funny enough, Ben just mentioned his own personal uh, issue with that this morning. Uh, so make sure you go in and verify all that. Income verification. So if you are on an income-driven repayment plan, you are still going to have to verify or certify your income, but you don't need to do a new certification until March of 2024. If your income has gone down, then yes, certainly you can recertify before then. Um, if for some reason you lost your job or you're not working, or again, you had a reduction in income uh, or your spouse had a reduction in income and you guys were filing jointly and payments were based off of that, uh, don't hesitate to uh, work with a servicer to get your income recertified. But if your income has gone up, maybe you filed um, single or separately and now you're married, things like that, you don't have to worry about recertifying that until March. And the last piece here is back to the, again, the news stories that you're seeing about some loan forgiveness happening. Uh, this is not blanket money that's being sent out to people. Most likely you're not missing out on anything. What's happening is the government's going back through and retroactively looking at people that have been on income driven repayment or even public student loan forgiveness and recounting uh, their payments. So they're making some payments that previously weren't counted towards their uh, repayment numbers uh, and counting those. And those are resulting in people then basically achieving the 20 years or 25 years of repayment uh, and the remaining debt being forgiven. So this is a kind of one thing to keep in mind too, is this is a one-time thing. This is not an ongoing um, um, action. So you're still going to need to keep on top of making sure that your loan payments are counted towards your income-driven repayment or public student loan forgiveness. So types of repayment plans, again, we won't dive deeply into all of these. The standard repayment, many people are familiar with that. That's kind of the default payment plan that you're put onto. So that's a 10-year amortized repayment plan. Um, pretty straightforward. Graduated repayment, uh, similar to standard, only your payments increase. So this is with the expectation that your income is going to go up over time. So usually about every two years, your payments will increase on the graduated plan. Extended repayment just extends the payment window. So instead of 10 years, you're at 25-year repayment. Uh, eligibility for all of these payment programs, you need to have direct loans. Uh, most people, if, if you've recently taken on loans, uh, they're probably direct loans, uh, subsidized, unsubsidized, federal Stafford loans, any plus loans, which are uh, parent loans, and then any consolidated loans. So if you took your direct loans or had, if you're <laughs> older and have fell loans or something like that and consolidate them, consolidated them, you are eligible for those payment plans. Income-driven repayment. Again, there is a variety of plans. The government has been kind of adding plans in as uh, since student loans began. So they've sort of changed over time. Each plan is a little bit different. From an eligibility perspective, they all individually have some different quirks as to who's eligible and who isn't. Things based on, uh, again, income, um, when you took your loans out, what type of loans. But in general, again, you if you have direct subsidized or unsubsidized loans, <clears throat> plus loans to students, so parent plus loans, uh, you have to do some work in order to be able to go into an income-driven repayment plan if you have a parent plus loan, uh, and then any consolidation loans. So again, if you have specific questions about your income-driven repayment plan or any of these plans, <clears throat> which plans make sense, which ones you're eligible for and eligible for, again, you can reach out to us or 
again, studentaid.gov uh, can kind of help point you in the right direction. So let's talk about income driven specifically. So income driven repayment plans are, uh, as they say, they're based solely on your income. It is not based on your debt level. Uh, there is, they're not taking, let's say if you owed $100,000 in student loans, they're not amortizing that amount over a certain number of years to figure out what your payment is. Uh, they're purely calculating it based on your income. So uh, there's pros and cons to that. Uh, one of the, I guess, cons is you yearly have to recertify your income. So if you do choose to use an income-driven repayment plan, Every year, you're going to have to certify your income uh, to verify that your income either hasn't gone up or down. And if it does go up, your payment's going to change. If it does go down, obviously, your payment can go lower. Uh, so that is an advantage. Loan forgiveness. So the goal with income-driven repayment is you're paying over a fixed period of time, typically 20 years for most payment plans uh, and undergraduate loans. If you have graduate loans, that window can be longer, up to 25 years, again, depending on the payment plan. But you're paying for 20 years or 25 years. That's the goal with income-driven repayment. So the expectation is you're paying over that window. You can certainly increase your payments to try to pay down quicker. Um, but uh, our recommendation or most recommendations is if you can pay down student loans faster, uh, or do a standard repayment plan, that's generally the way to go. Because even though your payments may be lower, you're paying over a much longer period of time. So when we do the math, it could net out that you're paying much more on income-driven repayment than you would be paying on a standard 10-year repayment plan. Now, if you are in an income situation where you are low income or uh, zero income, you've lost your job, you got laid off, certainly we have some turbulent times in the, the greater financial world. Uh, macro sense these days. So if you've run into some issues, uh, there is an opportunity to recertify your income. And if your income is low enough or zero, you could have zero payment. Um, when you come out of school, in terms of when does an income-driven repayment plan make sense? Again, low income, certainly. If you come out of school and you get your first job and your debt level is 2x what your salary is, income-driven repayment may make sense. So if you come out of school with $100,000 in student loans, but you're only making 40 or 50,000, probably should look into income-driven repayment. But keep in mind that kind of the last bullet point there, and probably the most important thing is everyone, you know, gets excited about having a lower payment, but income-driven repayment isn't necessarily your friend. Again, these are payment plans where you're going to be paying student loans over 20 or 25 years, you may not even be paying down principal. I'm sure you've read news stories of um, a person comes out of college and they have $60,000 in student loans and 20 years later, their student loan balance is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's because they their payments were so low, they were not even paying off the interest. Uh, so the interest just kept accruing. The balance never got paid down. Um, now, some of the payment plans like the new save plan we'll talk about here in a second, there are some caveats in there in, in terms of how they handle interest, but definitely if you're coming out of school, you've taken on new student loans, certainly talk to somebody, um, again, either us or somebody at studentaid.gov, um, maybe another student loan professional, whoever, um, if you have a friend that does that or whatever, definitely talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, don't just take, you know, friends advice uh, because there's a lot of, again, kind of details and caveats in there. Just an example, and it's probably hard to read this slide, but this is just a quick overview of some of the income-driven repayment plans. You can see there's some complexity just in terms of which loans are eligible, how the payments are calculated, um, the repay and pay plan. So the one all the way there on the right, uh, the repay plan, if you happen to be on repay, you're now going to be on the new save plan. And we'll talk about the details of that plan here on the next slide but you're gonna be automatically converted. The same plan definitely has advantages. There are opportunities to have a lower monthly payment because of the changes. So again, if you're struggling to make student loan payments, that's a good thing. Um, but again, just because you can get a lower payment doesn't mean that financially that works out for you in the long run. So the save plan, 
again, this has sort of been a, a leading news story ever since the loan forgiveness kind of fell through originally. So they've come out with a new repayment plan that's called SAVE, Saving on a Valuable Education. Uh, so if you were on repay, you will automatically be converted over to SAVE. So what are the advantages of SAVE plan? So the income exemption is now 225% of the poverty line versus 150%. So the way payments are calculated for income-driven repayment is there is a, every year they release what the poverty, poverty line numbers are, depending on how many people are in your family. So let's say you have a family of four and the poverty line for that is, again, rough numbers, $30,000. So before, if you were on repay, you would basically bump that 30,000 up to 45,000 and that gets deducted from your income. So if you're on repay, uh, you had the $30,000 poverty line, 150% of that is 45,000. So now your the income that they calculate off of is the 100,000 minus 45,000. So now instead of 150%, it's 225%. So instead of 45,000, it's 67,500, I think. I should have written that down. <laughs> I'm not trying to do math in my head, uh, but it's higher. So now uh, it's $100,000 worth of income minus the $67,000. And then what they do is they consider that balance. So what's left over after they subtract the poverty line calculation, that's your discretionary income. So that's, they consider that income that you get to spend on discretionary items, um, which in this case would be a student loan payment. Uh, so repay was 10%, uh, save is now 5% for undergraduate loans. So they take 5% of that 100,000 minus 67,500. So um, 32,500 times 5%, and that's how they figure out your annual payment. And they divide that by 12 for your monthly payment. So two big advantages right there for the SAVE program, higher um, poverty line levels, 225% and lower discretionary income number. Uh, there are some advantages if you have low balances. So borrows less than 12,000 in original principal can get forgiveness after 10 years. No negative amortization. This is important. So Previously, when you made uh, income-driven repayments, if you didn't cover all of the interest expense, that interest would get added on to your loan, uh, especially if you changed plans. There were some options or some um, instances where interest was covered for the first number of years, depending on whether you had unsubsidized or subsidized loans. Um, there was some specifics where uh, it wouldn't be accrued, you wouldn't amortize interest. But going forward with the SAVE plan, doesn't matter if your payment doesn't cover all the interest, it's not added onto your loan balance. And then the last piece, again, if you're familiar with income-driven repayment, how they calculate your income is based heavily on how you file your taxes. So if you are married filing jointly in the repay plan, you had to use both of your incomes added together. With SAVE, you can now uh, do married filed separately and take your own individual income. So you can reduce your income level. This helps if your spouse doesn't have any student loans. Um, or if they're a high earner and you have student loans, uh, it can help reduce your payment. Again, if you're struggling to make payments. So complex, a lot of calculations. Don't expect everyone to be able to do that on their own. That's why they have certifications like certified student loan professionals. Uh, that's why they have servicers working at the loan places uh, and for the government. Um, so certainly reach out. One quick slide, public student loan forgiveness. Um, so aside from forgiveness based on income-driven repayments, if you go into a field where you're working for um, a 501c3, so like a nonprofit, um, a state hospital, um, could be a government hospital, or doing dental work, things like that for a nonprofit, there's opportunities for you to get your loan balances forgiven in 10 years. Now it, it's, you have to be on one of those repayment plans that we talked about before. You have to make 120 qualifying payments, which there's some uh, certain requirements to make a payment qualified. So 120 payments, if you make 12 a year, that's 10 years worth. You have to work for a qualified employer. If you're trying to get public student loan forgiveness, make sure you verify that your employer is qualified. Uh, don't just assume you could get a year or two down the road and find out that you're um, expecting to get loan forgiveness in 10 years and 
two years that I was working for a non-qualified employer. So always be sure to check. Um, and the good thing about public student loan forgiveness is it's not taxable when it's forgiven at the end. Now that's one key point about income driven repayment. So prior to 2020, I think, uh, any loan forgiveness that was given through income driven repayment. So you got to the end of your 20 years, let's say you had a balance of $60,000 left, uh, that could be taxed as income. They've suspended that. They have not eliminated it. They've suspended it until 2026. So for now, if you are going to finish your payments sometime between now and 2026, uh, whatever balance is forgiven for income driven repayment should not be taxed as income. But if you're starting income-driven repayment now, there's no guarantees that they're going to extend it past 2026. Uh, we know that our government doesn't see eye to eye on student loan forgiveness. Uh, so if things change, there's a high likelihood things are gonna change on, on the student loan forgiveness side of things. So just keep that in mind, just another of the many factors to consider when uh, talking about income-driven repayment. And last but not least, so, uh, what what else is the government doing to help people with student loans? Because uh, goodness knows they, they need help for sure. So they've instituted what's now called a gainful employment rule. And to sort of sum up all, summarize all the text there, what the government is trying to do is make sure that people don't take on student loans going to school someplace where they're never going to make the money back to pay off the loans. So um, they're basically on a state level looking through graduate data. And if graduates from that institution with a degree don't make more than people in the state that don't have a college degree, um, they immediately get red flagged. Um, or if the students are coming out of their school with degrees, but are unable to make student loan payments, that's another red flag. So the these schools will get flagged in the system. And these are for-profit and non-degree certificate programs. So um, I guess the only one I could really think of is like a cosmetology school or something like that. So if you're taking on student loans in a for-profit or again, a non-degree program, uh, there's gonna be greater scrutiny on those schools. <clears throat> and sa same as like the online schools like uh, University of Phoenix and things like that. So the government's going to be looking at these institutions if they do get flagged and they get so if they get flagged the first time, when someone goes to apply for a loan, it'll come up in the system that says that that institution is flagged. Uh, and to be aware, you're taking out a loan for a school where there's a high chance you may not be able to pay it back. If they get flagged more than once uh, inside, I think, three years, they won't be able to receive any student aid money um, or no government money. So no student loan money will go to the institution. So definitely a good thing. Hopefully, um, preventing people from making bad mistakes in terms of, you know, what they're paying for and what school they're going to. But for now, again, that's only for-profit and non-degree school, non-degree certificate programs, not um, state schools. So there's some contention over that. So that is the slideshow. I know uh, I regurgitated a lot of words and a lot of numbers. Um, I think the key takeaways. So if you're on income-driven repayment now, definitely uh, check to make sure which program you're on, uh, log into the system, make sure your payments all look the same, make sure your auto pay is set up. If you're on anything other than repay or save now, it definitely makes sense to see whether or not you should be switching. Um, the government's not going to automatically switch you if you're not on repay. So validate all that. If you have kids that are coming out of school with student loans, uh, friends that are coming out of school with student loans, Certainly, you can refer them to this presentation, but if they have questions, um, definitely make sure that they reach out. And uh, even if we can't answer them, we can point them in the right direction. Or again, studentaid.gov, it's a government website, but it is pretty useful. There's a calculator on there. You can put your information in. It'll show you the payments for the various uh, income-driven repayment plans and kind of show you which one is best, uh, show you what the total payment is over the lifetime of the, the loan. Um, so there is helpful information there. But again, don't don't hesitate to reach out or um, send people our way if they have questions. And Tom, and I just I want to remind everybody to, um, if you have a question at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat button. You can type in a question and we can take those 
in uh, that fashion as well. The one other piece of advice that I might add while we're waiting on that is do not let this be a thing that you kick the can the, down the road on. Yes, there are very limited penalties for deferring until either March or September of this year, but knowing where you stand now and getting your arms around the issue at hand is going to be really important and provide for much better experience and probably allow you to sleep a lot better at night and be much more confident in your ability to pay back those loans. So best to get started now, like with most other financially related uh, elements of your life, it's never too early. And to piggyback off of that, there's a question that reinforces it uh, along the lines of, uh, I, I seem to keep reading that people are turning 60 or into their 60s still carrying student loan debt. Is that really true? Tom, what do you know about, I guess, the dispersion of loans in the population? And is that an effect that we're really seeing as people age carrying student loans almost to retire retirement age, full retirement age? Uh, yeah, that absolutely uh, happens. I don't know in terms of debt levels, uh, how much of the debt is held by 60 plus. Um, but yeah, you have the challenge of number one, people taking out loans later in life to maybe go to graduate school um, that they haven't paid off yet. You have a lot of parents uh, taking out plus loans to pay for their kids' college. So uh, definitely not unheard of to have somebody that's going on to uh, Medicare, talking about taking Social Security, uh, still making student loan payments. As a matter of fact, one of the examples in the certified student loan, the CSLP exam was someone that was 67 uh, on Social Security, still take or still paying off student loans. Um, so yeah, it happens, unfortunately. I happen to have this uh, handy. So if we wanted a, an actual breakdown, this is a little old. This is about two years old technically, but given that this is a during COVID piece of data, we expect not a lot of it to have changed super dramatically. So there is a large contingent of people over the age of 50. It's not broken up quite that way, but if you think about share of population over the age of 50 and that about a quarter of the student loans fall there, uh, to deflect a little bit of blame away from my generation in terms of student loan debt, it's not all us. Uh, <laughs> so this is about roughly a quarter of borrowers being over the age, or this is technically the dollar amount by student loan portfolio by age, um, most of it being concentrated in that 35 to 49 and dwindling for that under 24. So there's kids now that simply haven't had a lot of enough time to have the interest compound on their loans while they're in school or when they're not making the subsequent payments to necessarily catch up as a percentage of the total portfolio. But why do you think the 35 to 49 is more than the, the cohort below that? It seems like coming out of school, you would have more, you wouldn't see an ink. Are, are people just not paying as much and, and interest is accumulating and it's ballooning up in that age? A category? thousand percent. It has that to, is it's, it this is, this is the interest effect. Uh -huh. If, if I had to blame anything specifically, it is that if you are 24 and you have a, let's call it a 7% interest rate and you took out a hundred thousand dollars of loans and maybe you were riding on a public student loan forgiveness type of thing. And so you still have a lot to go and interest is accruing on there faster than you're paying it off or you just couldn't afford the payments from the jump and interest is accruing faster. You're making some sort of minimum payment, but you're very quickly ending up in the boat, which is sinking uh, for lack of a better, not to, not to borrow with the, not to get too into the metaphor of the boat being behind me, but that is very common. We see that happen uh, more often in the news stories where people highlight the ways that people are struggling with student loans, but I think it has some merit, even if they're showing us very extreme cases. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and with interest rates higher, that effect might even compound on over the next couple of decades. You well, especially especially more. if you've consolidated loans to a private borrower and that interest rate, they gave you some sort of terms that either one meant you had to give up sort of access to a lot of these programs or they gave you a payment number and not a total payback amount number where you're going to be maybe on a month month to month basis paying a little bit less but paying it over a longer period of time and ultimately paying a lot more back for the loan itself yeah one one point i didn't really <clears throat> make cuz we were just talking about the government loans but private student loans are a whole another uh mm -hmm. ball of yarn in terms of requirements um and the ability to have some flexibility when it comes to paying those back it's and being on the hook for that debt um, through thick and thin. So not, not saying don't ever take private loans, but make sure that you read all the fine print on those loans because they are much more restrictive. They stay with you uh, much longer, even potentially past death. So uh, always be aware of that. And just real quick, um, I think we had a couple questions. Yeah. I could take I think Ben, you're going to answer one. I'll, I'll take the second one. So there's a question. Is it better for parents to take the plus loans or should kids take on those their own loans? Um, look, everybody's situation is different. I think as financial advisors, you know, a, a pretty common theme and advice we have is you shouldn't compromise your retirement in order to pay for your kid's college. Uh, so while I don't want to throw out a blanket statement, I think generally our advice for most people is let your kids take on student loans if that's what makes sense. Um, certainly make sure that they're going to a school where they have the opportunity and studying in a degree that they have the opportunity to potentially pay them back. But it gives you much more flexibility. You know, you can always help them pay off the loans um, that you have that ability at any time. But Certainly, they have their whole li lives, life ahead of them to pay those loans down. And most likely, parents are, again, trying to save for retirement or coming up on retirement in the not-so-distant future. We'd much rather see that that debt burden be, well, we wouldn't like to see it, but uh, usually a better decision to have the kids take on the loans rather than the parents taking on more debt. And one other question we have, which I think we could probably spend another 25 minutes talking about, but we'll we'll try to keep it succinct. I wish I'd brought more charts for this one. What do you think will happen to the economy with student loan payments restarting? This is maybe one of the more popular questions asked by Americans all over the country. And my short answer to it is that we don't know. Uh, but the <laughs> slightly more detailed answer is a lot of these payment a lot of these programs that Tom talked about today are designed to be a much lower month to month cash flow impact to the average borrower that is that otherwise would be much more sensitive to student loan payments restarting so if without these programs you were making $5,000 a month and your student loan payments were going to be $400, that is more significant than if one of the payment programs allows you to have a $200 payment instead. So people have cited consumer spending as being very strong and it's sort of split on whether or not people think that consumer confidence and consumer spending is going to continue with this. Wall Street Journal published an article the other day saying, Americans won't quit spending that profiled as much as I hate to choose extreme examples of people that are not saving for down payments on homes, not saving for retirement particularly, and are actively choosing to spend money on things that they enjoy. And so if student loan repayments are going to cut into that discretionary spending of theirs, and it happens on a broad enough scale, then yeah, that'll ultimately hurt the economy in some way. But we don't see a lot of other indicators that it'll be materially impactful enough to actually you know, cause anything in the short term. We won't know by the end of the year. We might know in a year seriously how impactful it might have been. 
I would, if you all have thoughts on that, please jump in. I, I like the part where you said, really, there's no way for us to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of that comes down to all over the last few months, consumer expenditure, the, I, I shared something on LinkedIn the other week that was detailing how important the American consumer is to the economy. We are a consumer driven economy. Somewhere around 70% of GDP is dedicated to consumer spending. So if debt repayment suddenly has to go towards things that aren't consumer spending, then definitely that'll impact the economy negatively. It'll probably take time for that to happen. American savings, their excess savings are dwindling, but that doesn't mean that there isn't room for their budgets to take this. And we'll probably know more um, by the end of the year what direction that's headed in, if it's going to materially be uh, a shock to the economy. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, not to belabor it, but, you know, we're luckily, and you can argue how long this is going to last, but we still have good employment numbers, mm -hmm. which just have been going up. Um, so the hope is it, it doesn't impact people as negatively as, as what it may seem. Um, but yeah, to Ben's point, it's, it's tough to get people to stop spending. So it's there's potential for people just taking on more debt. So we'll have to see. It'll take a while to play out, most likely. All right. Looks like we have maybe one more question. I'll try to paraphrase it, but I think it's getting to, not to uh, sound political, but uh, why has the the government student loan forgiveness uh, discussions and program, why has that become such a political football? What are the pros and cons of the government repaying? Why are they doing it? What are some of the pros and cons uh, to that type of program? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can throw myself on my sword on this one. Um, <laughs> I think it just comes down to Democrats and Republicans just are on opposite sides of every issue, whether it makes sense or not. I think the Republican point of view is that, that the government's spending too much money. Um, and I'm sure you've heard in the news stories, and again, every day there's things about government spending levels um, and debt levels that are increasing quickly. Uh, so, you know, forgiving student loans is just another burden on the government from a fiscal perspective perspective because that's money they're never going to get paid back um and I, I don't claim to know the ins and outs of every republican's point of view but i think that's kind of generally the line um and also there's you know there's an issue of how do you do it fairly uh, that's another kind of point that keeps cropping up every time they talk about forgiveness and it came up when they were talking about issuing the 20 20 or twenty five thousand dollar uh payments, you know, how do you make it fair? And what about the people that already paid? And so that I think is an arguing point. I don't really know how strongly tied to that they are, but you know, the, the flip side argument is that, uh, you know, you forgive debt and people live better, happier lives. They spend more, they're more productive. Uh, and so it's better for the economy. I mean, you can certainly make the case that the growth in the economy from the forgiven debt, people spending that money into the economy would make up for uh, any debt that's forgiven. So, um, you know, you, you can see there's, there is logic on both sides. The problem is that they're unable to come to any kind of middle ground. Um, so, you know, do I think, I, I don't think anytime in the near future, there's going to be that student loan forgiveness program is going to come back alive, certainly uh, not in the next 12 months. Um, and depending on how the elections go, it may be a long, long time. We'll have to see. Mm -hmm. That's the only point. Take the home. only point I'll add are, are, it seems like at least this administration is taking a smaller stepwise approach. Tom mentioned at the beginning about $9 billion being forgiven. That's they mentioned specifically 125,000 borrowers that were a combination of firefighters, teachers, other public service employees that uh, had not been, I guess, appropriately accounted for some of their payments and therefore were making that 
the other encouraging thing that I see that it is it going to is going to do another uh, load of the lift for eliminating some of the tails of the student loan problem is this prevention of people taking out money for loans that or for schools that just won't pay them back. And we have pretty good data on what degrees are worth it, what degrees are not, what schools are worth it, what schools are not. And I think a lot of the sort of horror stories that the student loan discussion has brought to the limelight of the public conversation around it, it are those people that were pressured or had very poor uh, information going into taking on these loans and they followed them around for years and years. If the impact of these student loans is in such a way that it does hurt the economy in a way that's not unemployment driven, not that people aren't necessarily losing their jobs, but we do see a dramatic slowdown in the economy um, and inflation has come down appropriately, is there, there's a chance that that discussion comes back to the forefront of people's minds, but uh, that'll be because people are feeling more pain than they are now. You know, right now, the, the pain is sort of in small pockets and we're still trying to fight inflation, which is everybody's number one problem over the longer term. So, Perfect. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have today. So I think we're going to wrap it up here, but we will be posting uh, this webinar on our website and we'll send that information out in case anybody wants to listen back to the words of wisdom of these gentlemen. Thank you everybody for joining today. Thanks. Thanks.